Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist, and I am here to give you your week's lecture on motion perception for sensation and perception. Uh, now, before we begin, I do want to spend a little time giving you a few quick reminders about what uh, to expect this week. So in addition to focusing on uh, your chapter on motion perception, um, your sixth quiz will post on e-learning uh, on Friday, March 27th. It will be due the following Friday at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I will also have a rubric for your alternative assignment. Assignment, uh, since we will not be doing the psychophysics project uh, by the end of the week, so also on the 27th for you. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. This is our last major section on vision before we start talking about hearing. So this is probably one of the more important aspects related to vision. When we're constantly moving throughout the world, we need to keep track of things that are changing around us at all times. And so this requires us to be able to process motion to some extent. So here's what we're gonna talk about in this week's lecture. We're gonna talk about how the brain actually handles motion. We'll talk about how we interpret moving stimuli. We will talk about eye movements and saccades. So the different types of eye movements that we do when we are fixating on different objects in the world and when we're reading. And then we will close with talking about the development of motion perception. So we're going to start by talking about how the brain handles motion. And uh, one of the things that I will definitely be doing because I cannot show you um, these different types of illusions uh, in class, I am frequently going to uh, pause the lecture to go onto the companion site and show you a few different examples of these different types of effects. And I would highly encourage you to take a look at the companion website and try some of these different activities yourself to get a better handle on things. So one of the first things that we have to talk about, if we were wanting to think about, um, if we were wanting to think about motion and something that could detect motion, um, how would we potentially design that? And so your chapter kind of starts off by talking about how the brain might potentially develop what we would consider a motion detector. Now really, all motion is, is looking at change over time. In particular, we would need to look at a change in position over time. So that is the kind of thing that we would want to be able to track. Now, here's what's really critical. We want to make sure that we have two receptors nearby in visual space that can actually help track that change. Because if motion is a change in perception, I need to make sure that if I watch my dog running, that one receptor can keep track of him in the first position and an adjacent receptor can keep track of him in the second position. Now, one of the other things that you need to focus on is the incorporation of a time delay. Now, why would you want that? You would want that because if you have these two adjacent receptors, you want to make sure that you're noticing the same object over time rather than two separate objects um, in both of those receptive fields. So I'm gonna show you an image that kind of explains a little bit more about what I mean. Feel free to follow along with my cursor um, so you can kind of see what I'm focusing on. So the idea behind their incorporating a time delay of sorts is because, so here's a receptive uh, field for a hypothetical neuron A. Here's a receptive field for a hypothetical neuron B. Now we want to have, we need to incorporate a time delay of some sort because what could potentially happen is that if I have a ladybug uh, in receptive field A and I have a ladybug in receptive field B, we're talking about two separate ladybugs in these receptive fields, but it's possible that if your motion detector does not incorporate a time delay, um, 
then you're going to think that you saw motion when motion is not actually happening. We want to track a single object over time. So we wanna make sure that we can tell that this ladybug that is currently in receptive field B was previously in receptive field A. So we wanna make sure that we can keep track of that aspect. Um, now, obviously, this is, now on the other hand though, if we've got two separate ladybugs in these receptive fields, this is a case where you could think that you saw motion even when you actually didn't. So these are two separate ladybugs, this is motion. And unfortunately, if you don't have that time delay, it's possible that you could think that motion occurred even when it didn't. So one of the things that we want to do we need to incorporate that delay function, which here is highlighted by this potential cell called D. And then we have a multiplicative function here that basically keeps track of the fact that we had an object in A, and now it's currently in receptive field B. There was a delay, and because of that, we will detect motion. We want to make sure that what we're seeing is actually motion and not two separate objects in two different receptive fields, creating an illusion of motion where motion does not exist. So to kind of give you an example of what we mean here, so A and B are separate neurons with their own receptive fields. M is basically functioning as our hypothetical motion detection cell, and it has to be able to connect to A and B to be able to detect changes in position. Now, as I mentioned, here's a case where we have smooth motion. So you can kind of see that there's a time delay there. Here is a case where we've got two separate ladybugs in, in the receptive fields of A and B. But again, because we don't have a delay function here, there's the case that we may think that movement has occurred when it has not. So we need to incorporate D which hypothetically either tracks a delay or delays transmission of input from that first cell. And then finally, we have our multiplicative function that only fires when the, uh, the delay function and B are active. So ideally, this is how motion detection could theoretically work. Now, I realize that that's kind of dense, so let's get into a little bit more fun. So ideally too, these could map over a larger area so that we throughout the visual field so that we are looking at smooth motion through our entire visual field. Now, this also potentially explains apparent motion. So what you're kind of looking at here is an image of Daffy Duck um, dancing around. And if these images were, they're all static, and this is how animation works. Animation works because we take a bunch of static images and we flip through them so quickly that we get the illusion of motion where no motion actually exists. So motion can absolutely be detected in the absence of actual motion. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time showing you what this looks like. Um, so what we're gonna look at here is apparent motion. This is on our companion website. I'm gonna be flipping back to this um, every now and then. So I'm going to start by clicking on here. So right now what you're looking at is a dot um, that is kind of moving back and forth. I'm going to go ahead and start at 10. Okay, I'm not going to keep it at 10 because that is really flickery and it's a bit of a problem and um, it might make some of y'all a little sick. Like that's a bit of a problem. But let's start increasing the delay a little bit. So I'm going to 50. Yeah, it's still pretty bad. How about 85? It kind of looks like it's moving a little bit, right? If I increase that delay, it looks like it's moving even more. So instead of looking like a single or two separate dots in two different positions, we get the illusion that we're looking at a dot that is constantly jumping back and forth. And this is what is referred to as apparent motion. And so I'm gonna read a little bit of this here just so you can kind of see. The experience of apparent motion is dependent on two variables, the physical separation of the two stimuli and the alternation rate. Um, you should find that moving the circles closer together 
um, heightens the perception of apparent motion, dragging them apart by more than about a centimeter will actually change that. So I'm gonna go ahead and drag these apart right now and let's see if we see motion. Eh, not really. But how about if I speed that up? Eh, now they look like they're both on the screen at the same time, but let's change it. Now that looks a little bit better, but they're still really too far apart to make a difference. Let's drag them a little closer. Let's drag them right here. Now that kind of looks like one single dot constantly jumping back and forth. Um, at the shortest delay, you'll appear to see flickering um, without any sense of motion. When the delay is increased, you might experience what is called phi, a perception of motion without intermediate positions. At slightly longer delays, true apparent motion is experienced in which um, intermediate positions can be sensed. So this is a case where you're actually seeing true apparent motion. That's pretty cool. And part of the reason that this happens is because you are getting that rapid alternation of objects appearing in those different receptive fields in rapid succession. And because there is a little bit of that time delay in that rapid succession, we get the perception of motion, even though no motion is actually present. Now, one of the things that we will find is that a lot of the visual problems that we talked about before um, also will persist in motion detection. One of these big problems that we talked about before uh, occurred when we talked about binocular disparity. So we had the correspondence problem. Um, so how do we know that what we see in our left eye is matching up with what we see in our right? Similar sort of ideas happen with uh, motion detection. So in this case, if I'm looking at two different frames changing back and forth, which feature in frame two will correspond to the feature in frame one? One other potential issue that we have to work around is what is called the aperture problem. So if I look at a moving object viewed through an aperture, um, we are actually not able to figure out the direction of the motion of that local feature. And I'll give you a few examples to kind of help explain both the correspondence problem and the aperture problem. So the correspondence problem kind of works this way. So if I'm looking at these two different squares that are constantly alternating back and forth between frame one and frame two, so it creates um, this sense of downward diagonal motion. So here is here are two, three different circles in frame one. Here are three different circles in frame two. So let's take the middle circle that we see in frame one. Is it moving directly downward in frame two? or is it moving uh, directly on the diagonal to dot, not, dot C? We can't actually tell. So let's see if we can look at a little bit more about the correspondence problem. Um, I don't think it's actually in there. Let's see if it's in here. Here we go, motion correspondence. So here is kind of an idea. So in this particular case, um, when this activity loads, you're gonna see uh, squares in a circle. And at least to me, they look like they're moving. Click on the step button to the left several times. The motion will stop and you'll see that there are only two frames in this movie. So this is it, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Even when I'm doing this, I still see a little bit of motion there. Um, so here's how we're gonna kind of do this. So play starts the movie. So we get this perception, we get this perception that this dot is going to move down to here. But since we're only looking at two different frames, it's possible that in the next frame, it's actually moving here. But we can't really tell when we're looking at the motion. So this is kind of what the correspondence problem really is. Um, now the aperture problem, is a little bit different. So this is a case where we're actually viewing something through an aperture. And we'll kind of see how this works in this particular activity. So we'll go back to our types of motion. And we'll go to our aperture problem. Okay. So here is another example of that correspondence problem looking at frame one and frame two. So right now, 
Um, you can kind of see with this first movie, it looks like it's constantly moving diagonally back and forth like we saw. Now let's move it through an aperture. Now how is it moving? Doesn't look like it's moving diagonally at all. It looks like it's moving up and down. So when we view the same square through a small aperture, the movement direction shifts. Um, so you'll also kind of notice that the speed seems to change a little bit as well. Now, if we open this up a little bit, so clearly viewing motion through uh, one aperture doesn't really tell us very much about the motion of the object. We're looking at something that looks like it's moving diagonally, and here through this small aperture, we're seeing vertical motion. So what this kind of tells us is that viewing motion through an aperture creates ambiguity. Now, one of the ways that we can reduce this ambiguity open up four. So once again, now that we have four, you can kind of see that that diagonal motion has come back a little bit. Now I see diagonal motion. Some of you may not. You may notice that these top square, th this square and this square are still moving up and down. And these two are moving side to side rather than that smooth diagonal motion. Um, let's go ahead and try this. Now it's a little bit easier to see and you can actually see the smoother uh, diagonal motion. Now here's one more case of the aperture problem, which I kind of show you here on this slide. Um, so here um, we can kind of see that all of these items look like they're moving in the exact same way up and to the left. Now when we open this, you can actually see that the global motion for each of these is completely different. So this is really what the aperture problem states. We can't really tell how much something is move. We can't really tell the global direction of movement by looking at something through a local aperture. So how do we figure out the direction of motion? As I mentioned, the more local apertures or receptive fields that we have, we get better information about that global motion. And one of the things that we will find is that because the aperture, one single aperture provides so much ambiguity, the more of those you have and the more of those that seem to agree with each other, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to figure out a direction of motion. And in fact, the motion direction that's matched in all local apertures will determine the global motion direction of the object. So here, We've got some motion detectors, and you'll notice that they mention that this happens in V1 because many of our simple and complex cells respond to angle of orientation and our complex cells remove uh, respond to movement. Uh, this is definitely one of those cases where early motion processing can actually occur in primary visual cortex. So if I'm looking through these four different apertures from frame one and frame two, even though they're all kind of telling me something different, with these four different apertures, they all seem to have greater agreement that diagonal motion is happening. And thus, as a result, you're going to be more likely to perceive downward diagonal motion than downward vertical motion or leftward diagonal motion. So where in the brain are these motion detectors located? Um, one of the first areas that we see really seems to play a role in this are those magnocellular layers, um, those rod-driven circuits that make contact in the thalamus. Um, and so this really starts in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And researchers have actually found that if you damage those portions of the thalamus, people have difficulty perceiving large, rapidly moving objects. But what we can see is that motion detection does happen in early visual cortex. There is some processing in V1 and to a lesser, ex and to other extents, V2 and V3. But by and large, a good majority of our understanding of motion perception comes from area MT, um, the middle temporal area. And one of the things that we find is that the cells in this particular location are very selective for motion in a particular direction. 
So let's talk a little bit about the importance of medial or uh, middle temporal areas. So Newsom and Pear uh, in 1988 actually looked at motion perception in monkeys. So what they looked at were moving dot displays that are have a certain amount of correlation in direction of motion. So if we have 100% correlation in these dot displays, they're all going to move in the exact same direction. If we have 50% about 50% of the dots are moving in the same direction. If we have 20%, only 20% of the dots are. And so really quick, again, I can kind of show you an example of what this looks like. So we're going to look at correlated dot motion. So here is image one. Um, all of the dots are in correlated motion to the left. They are all moving to the left. Now, if we look at image two, this is uh, 50%. You can still see uh, some of this uh, upward motion, but it's a little harder to figure out. Uh, image three is a 20% correlated dots. Um, this one is a little bit harder to figure out. All of the other dots are, f are moving in random locations. But if you're having trouble figuring this out, um, this is a case where we can remove the random dots and you can see that about 20% of the dots are moving, um, are moving to the right. It's kind of hard to notice that here. But it turns out that uh, MT is really critical for that motion perception. Uh, when Newsom and Pear actually lesioned MT in monkeys, they actually found that it was much more difficult for the monkeys to indicate the proper direction of motion in these displays. Um, interestingly enough as well, it turns out that when you electrically stimulate parts of um, MT, we do actually find that when you stimulate them in certain ways, um, you can actually buy motion detection. So in this particular case, um, they would look at neurons that responded to one particular direction. Um, they would look at the ones that responded, for example, to right. And then they would look, um, they would stimulate those MT neurons and the monkeys would then show a uh, they would report motion in the stimulated neurons preferred direction even when they were moving in a completely different direction so stimulating these cells uh if if a cell has a particular preference and you stimulate it we're actually going to find that the monkey reports that the motion matches the cell's preferred range of motion even if that's not what they're actually seeing 